Recently, mainland China has seen a disturbing rise in violent incidents. On March 10, in Feixiang District, Handan, Hebei Province, a harrowing incident occurred where three miners took the life of another miner. After committing their crime, they chillingly returned to school as if nothing had happened. Their elaborate planning and brutal actions have sent shivers down the spine. However, the tragedies don't stop there. On March 19, four vicious traffic incidents happened in just one day, with at least one being suspected as an act of societal revenge by someone bearing grudges, leading to many deaths. In times of economic decline, especially with significant youth unemployment, a decline in public security often follows, which can even lead to societal breakdown. Is Chinese society now facing such a dire phase? It's all covered in today's China Truths. The cold-blooded action shocked the nation. On the elite forum show of NTD television, experts delved into the disturbing trends of violence among youth in China. Li Jun, an independent TV producer, highlighted that the Handan case, where three 13-year-olds took the life of a peer over a few hundred yuan, has resonated more profoundly than the well-known chained woman and who sinew incidents. The meticulous planning, including one who dug a grave, another who lured the victim, a third who delivered the final blow with a shovel, and a lookout who ensured they weren't caught, followed by their casual return to school, has left many people horrified. Lee said that he really wants to understand what kind of social environment, family upbringing, and educational background could produce such devilish traits in them. This case has prompted parents to be horrified and must reconsider their approaches to parenting, contemplating whether they should teach their children to be more assertive in dealing with bullies, to avoid becoming victims themselves. The idea that some parents would prefer visiting their child in jail over grieving at their grave underscores the deep-seated fear and desperation. Li Jun attributes this tragedy partly to the CCP's early indoctrination of hate and violence, which can lead children to develop violent tendencies and extreme behaviors. He pointed out that when Chinese children exhibit violent or bullying behavior, it is often ignored by schools. The three perpetrators were known to have bullied their victim for a long time without any intervention from the school or efforts to conceal the bullying, further emboldening their violent behavior by making them believe their actions would have no repercussions. Lee also noted the stark contrast in the U.S., where schools take any signs of aggression among students very seriously. Sharing an experience involving his own child in an American school, Lee recounted how a student's angry outburst and death threat were met with immediate and thorough intervention by the school, including counseling sessions to understand the context and emotional state behind the statement, as well as communication with the parents. This approach helps children understand the inappropriateness of such thoughts, thereby preventing potential crises. Chen Wei, a U.S. practicing attorney and executive chairman of the Chinese Democratic Party, discussed how the three suspects casually returned to their classroom after the incident, showing a lack of understanding of the gravity of their actions. According to Chen, this reflects a serious societal issue in China, with numerous similar cases stirring public concern. He believes these issues, deeply troubling to the Chinese public, highlight a significant societal challenge tied to the CCP's rule, beyond just parental or educational responsibility. Young people face high pressure and rising hostility, Chinese society enters a dangerous phase. Senior editor Shi Shan highlighted a troubling trend in Chinese society, a sharp increase in violence. This isn't just about the Handan case, there have been a slew of public safety incidents across China, including Beijing, with four intentionally tragic traffic accidents on Tuesday alone, March 19, resulting in severe injuries and fatalities. Particularly striking was an incident in Taizhou, Zhujiang, where a student rammed his car into a crowd, killing three and injuring about sixteen. It's believed he acted out of societal resentment, driven by joblessness. In Beijing, another driver aggressively ran into pedestrians, exhibiting blatant arrogance afterward, turning this day into a Black Tuesday. This has led to discussions among netizens about the increasingly pervasive sense of malevolence in China. Shershan pointed out that economic booms often mask underlying social tensions, which emerge and escalate when the economy takes a downturn. Currently, China faces a multitude of challenges, leading to escalating conflicts within the populace, against societal structures, 
and against the government, pushing society toward a precipice. Chen Wei also shared his thoughts, suggesting that the societal breakdown under CCP rule might hit young people the hardest. This demographic is especially vulnerable, lacking protection, and prone to rash, sometimes devastating decisions, from violent acts to ending their own lives. He contrasted this with the approach in the United States and the Western world, where there's a stronger focus on safeguarding minors and preventing such dire incidents. Unlike China, where rectifying these issues seems daunting, the West is more committed to addressing and correcting such behaviors. Governance failure leads CCP toward militarism. Also on the Elite Forum, Epic Times editor-in-chief Guizhun shed light on a disturbing trend in Chinese society, a sharp rise in violence and a growing sense of aggression among the youth, which she ties directly to the economic downturn, putting a strain on societal stability. According to the CCP, China's current urban unemployment rate is around 5%, with the youth unemployment rate at 15%. However, these numbers are met with skepticism, with some experts suggesting the real figure for youth unemployment could be as high as 50%. The significance of youth unemployment rates lies in their direct correlation with social stability, structure, and safety. A spike in youth unemployment usually leads to deteriorating public security, a situation common across nations. Economic growth faces its ups and downs and especially for a society transitioning from mere sustenance to a more comfortable living standard, challenges in social order and stability become increasingly evident. Reflecting on the United States during the 1930s Great Depression, Ms. Gua highlighted the parallel challenges of high social unrest and a 40% unemployment rate, which fueled the rise of organized crime, including the notorious mafia. This period also inspired the creation of iconic superheroes such as Batman and Spider-Man, portraying the grim reality of Depression-era America through dark, somber film narratives that accentuated widespread crime among the lower classes. The U.S. managed to navigate out of this bleak period thanks to two critical factors, the economic revival propelled by the industrial boom of World War II, and the societal reforms initiated by President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, which laid the groundwork for the extensive social welfare and governmental restructuring seen in the U.S. today. Misqua pointed out that this phase is not unique to the U.S. Other developed countries like the U.K., France, and Germany have experienced similar economic fluctuations. Overcoming such downturns is crucial to avoiding the middle-income trap and achieving developed status. A feat will remains pessimistic about China accomplishing in the coming decade. With China's economy in decline and government revenues shrinking, the CCP's approach has been to impose austerity measures on lower-ranking civil servants through pay cuts and layoffs, a strategy Gua views as indicative of failing state governance and a misguided response to financial adversity. By contrast, during the Great Depression in the U.S., President Roosevelt chose to uplift the income of the lowest earners, even employing the unemployed for national projects like wood chopping in public squares, road construction, and introducing social welfare initiatives, thus prioritizing the welfare of the most vulnerable over maintaining government finances. Misqua warns that the CCP's response to its dwindling revenue, which includes increasing penalties and reducing the income and jobs of lower-level civil servants, will only exacerbate social conflicts and tensions. She cautions that the CCP is likely to continue fortifying its stability maintenance efforts and offloading these responsibilities onto local governments, a doomed approach signaling governance failure. Furthermore, Gua sees a dangerous potential for the CCP to veer into militarism in the face of economic challenges, mirroring the path taken by pre-World War II Germany and Japan, which sought to divert domestic pressure through external expansion, leading to global conflict. Signs of China increasing its military spending and engaging in external provocations, warning of similarly dire consequences. Nation in deep crisis, Xi Jinping forced to return to Mao's legacy for survival? The Chinese Communist Party is not just facing public dissatisfaction but is also dealing with its own share of unrest. This includes a series of unsettling events, numerous military officials have mysteriously vanished, a black sedan rammed into Xinhua Gate amidst the National People's Congress, Xi Jinping was seen chastising Zhao Liji, the chairman of the National People's Congress, publicly, and all mentions of Yi Weidong, the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, 
who called for a crackdown on fake combat capabilities in the military, have been scrubbed from the internet. Reacting to these tensions, Xi Jinping made a trip to Changsha in Hunan province on the 18th, following the legislative sessions. His itinerary started at Mao Zedong's old school, Hunan First Normal University, where he even visited Mao's old dormitory and bed. Associate Professor Chong Li Fong from the University of Technology Sydney interprets Xi's actions as an attempt to rally support by invoking Mao's legacy amid growing doubts about his leadership. Against this backdrop, Radio Free Asia released an opinion piece on the 20th, pointing to four indicators that a significant political shift in China might be on the horizon, with the possibility of a systemic crack within the CCP increasing. The article lays out four critical signs. Xi Jinping's governance is backsliding disastrously, setting up a scenario where outsiders lead experts, with the party towering over the government and Xi imposing his will over the entire party, dragging China back to the Maoist era and precipitating a total breakdown in politics, economy, and society. Both active and passive forms of resistance are on the rise, with public frustration building up to a boiling point, ready to burst at any moment. The military's discontent with Xi is growing, not waning leading party insiders to look for exits as they feel like they're crossing a river on a sinking clay idol. Lastly, the escalation of black swan events, which used to be seen as catalysts for China's transformation, are now occurring en masse, spanning the economy, finance, agriculture, supply chains, real estate, and diplomacy. These omnipresent black swans could precipitate a sudden pivotal moment for China, or even a swift break in the CCP system. The commentary wraps up with a stark warning, the greater the public's dissatisfaction, the more she tightens his grip on the populace, the harsher she's crackdowns become, the less the people can bear it. This cycle increasingly points to a potential fracture within the CCP system, possibly signaling the abrupt onset of a post xi era. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths.